Hi, I'm Dan Barker, and welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. Dan and I are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, an organization of more than 32,000 freethinkers, atheists, and agnostics working to keep state and church separate. Did you know that there are atheists in the pulpit? Today, we're going to talk with one of the principal founders of the Clergy Project, Linda Lescola. The Clergy Project is an online support group for ministers and priests and rabbis who have abandoned their faith in the supernatural and are stuck in the pulpit. I know the feeling. Linda Lascola has been a qualitative researcher for three decades. She and Tufts University professor of philosophy and well-known author Daniel C. Dennett collaborated on a project that was published in Evolutionary Psychology in 2010. The study is titled, Preachers Who Are Not Believers. Daniel Dennett introduced Linda Lascola when she spoke at one of our recent annual conventions. But the driving force of caught in the pulpit after that of the creation of the clergy project is Linda Lascola. I'm very proud of her. Daniel Dennett and Linda Lascola were both principal founders of the clergy project along with me and scientist Richard Dawkins, which started in 2011, the year after their article was published. They went on to write a book about their study called Caught in the Pulpit, Leaving Belief Behind. So, Linda Lascola, welcome to Free Thought Matters. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us, how did all of this begin, your, your research study on even that someone would realize that there were atheists in the pulpit? Well, um, it, it started because I was curious. I was a researcher and I had read Dan Dennett's book, um, Breaking the Spell, in which he suggested that research should be done on religion just the way it had been done on sex and many other uh, issues. It should be done in a scientific way. And I thought that was a great idea. And I had been doing a lot of reading myself and wondering why, wondering how clergy who learned about uh, how the Bible was made in seminary then went out and would teach something else. When I learned that information in my own personal study of religion, I immediately, almost immediately, became an atheist. Hmm. And I wondered, well, if it happened to me, why doesn't it happen to them? So I wanted to know more about it. Yeah, but That's sometimes they don't actually learn about it in seminary. They, they learned, like me, I learned how to preach. And it was later in my studies. It wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. early, but somewhere in that line. Thank you for bringing that up because um, it's only the uh, liberal clergy and Roman Catholics who go to seminary after college and have to finish a two or three year course in seminary before they be can become ministers. Whereas a lot of Pentecostals and other fundamentalists are filled with the spirit. Yeah. And, uh, and then immediately become preachers. Which is kind of like what happened to mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So you do what you call qualitative research. Right. How, does that, what, what, how does that differ from other kinds? You do a lot, you interview people on different interview subjects. interview people in depth, and it has nothing to do with statistics. And although um, the interviews involve a, a set of issues that you want to discuss, they don't set, include a set of specific questions. It allows the interviewer, and I'm a clinical social worker by training, so I, I know how to interview people. I know how to deal with feelings and so forth. It allows you to take what you learn from the person who you're speaking to and go from there. You don't have to follow a set uh, uh, list of questions. So it's not like you're making a data statistical analysis? Not at all. There's nothing, the nothing statistical about it. And you, and you shouldn't try to make anything So how do you feel today now it's us interviewing you, right? It's I think different. it's wonderful. I'm, <laughs> I had no idea that it would ever come to this, that my curiosity would make such a difference. So how did you two find the subjects? That was hard, and you helped with that, Dan. Uh, we knew it would be difficult uh, because these are people, if they exist, uh, are in secret. We knew that you existed, but that's the only one we were really sure of. Uh, and so um, we... That's why we did a small study at the beginning. We did a pilot study, and it included five people. You, I think, brought us three of them, uh, people that, that had read your book and called you on the phone, screwed up the courage to call you on the telephone, and just essentially want some assistance from you, wanting, want, wanting to know that 
that there was someone there who had experienced the same kind of thing that they had. And then the other person who helped us was a former Episcopal pastor of mine. His name was Jim <laughs> Adams, and he was an agnostic in the pulpit, and he said so. And in the Episcopal Church, you can do that sort of thing. <laughs> he retired and started an organization and, um, and of other liberal clergy. And so I contacted him, and I told him about the study I was doing. And uh, what he did was he uh, gave us names of people who belonged to his organization. He didn't really know what their beliefs were in particular. And so I contacted some of those people and asked them a few questions, and the other people came from, from that list. And that made up the original five people that we spoke to. And then it grew into a much larger research well, study. Well, after that was published in uh, first the Washington Post and then Evolutionary Psychology, it made a big splash, which surprised me. As far as I was concerned, I was doing a small study of something that interested me. Um, but as soon as it got published and got a lot of uh, attention, a lot of it was negative attention, I will say, um, but we got a lot of uh, emails from clergy who said, you know, I, I, could, I could have been one of those people in that study. Yeah, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So you realized you were, you were fleshing them out. Yes. So that larger study then turned into a book. Yes, it did. And uh, tell us about the book. Well, the book included 30 clergy and, and in that group of what we call clergy were some seminary students because I wanted to learn about them as well. And it also included three seminary professors. Uh, and all these were people who contacted us after the original study was done. In fact, many more people than that contacted us, but we could only use so many people in the study. Uh, and um, then that eventually worked into the clergy project. What happened was, what Dan, Dennett and I did not know was that Dan Barker and Richard Dawkins had talked years before, is that right, Dan, about Some doing years, something yeah. doing something for the clergy, but you, it was hard to find them. You had a short list. Well, I had some friends and acquaintances, and I knew some phone calls, which was part of how I helped you people. Mm -hmm. But uh, somewhere, it was in Copenhagen, I think, Daniel Dan is just out of, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, excuse me, just mm -hmm. out of the blue, said, you know, there's atheists in the pulpit, and they're stuck. And he's been thinking about this, and maybe we should do something about that. Maybe we could help some of them. Mm -hmm. So that got our brains thinking about the same time your brains were thinking about the same thing. Yeah. So. And when I heard that you were actually thinking of starting some sort of a, an organization with them, I thought, isn't that wonderful? Because these people were so eager to talk to me. But a lot of them also said, do you know, what are the other people like that you're talking to them, that, that you're talking to? What, you know, are they anything like me? And I really couldn't tell them very much because this is a part of an academic study. But I knew how eager they were to talk uh. to me and how eager they were to talk to each other, but they couldn't find each other. And this would be a way to do it through the Clergy Project. So the Clergy Project now has how many people? Well, we started uh, uh, right now in, in the summer of 2018 as we're taping the show. We just crossed 900 no kidding. in the group. So wow. that's something. In 2011, uh, we started with about 50 or 52? 52. 52. We call it the founding 50 or something, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was a large number at the time. It was, and I think it was like half came from people I had who had contacted me and Dan Dennett about the study, and the other half were people that you had known through the years. And then, we, and then I put out the word, are there any others of you out there? But mm -hmm. do you remember that meeting we had in D.C. in yes. January mm -hmm. of 2011? You and... Um, Robin, Robin Cornwell, Cornwell and I. Robin Cornwell mm -hmm. was R Richard Dawkins Foundation. Mm -hmm. And we met at the uh, American Indian Museum yes. there uh, and had lunch. And should we do something? Shouldn't we? We didn't even have a name for it. Mm -hmm. And you and Robin were thinking, well, how can we do it? And then the Richard Dawkins Foundation, she said, would put up the money. Because it right. cost quite a bit of money to mm -hmm. put up this whole project. The original website. The original yes. website and all that. Uh, and then I. You were involved heavily in getting that thing off the ground, along with some of the active clergy, like Adam Mann. Adam Mann, yes. He was actually in the, the pilot study that, that uh, we did originally and, and had contacted you originally and was very, very eager to do something. And he turned out to be a wonderful person to work with. I mean, it's, not, it's very unusual for me to interview someone and then years later actually be in a working relationship with them. Mm -hmm. But he had a lot of technical knowledge to start the website which I didn't have, and he was very eager and extremely helpful, and we got, we got the thing up and running. It was a very exciting time. I remember um, somewhere in there, he emailed us. He said, I'm in my office after preaching on Easter Sunday morning, <laughs> and I've locked the door, and I can tell you, you won't believe the 
crap I had to say this morning from the <laughs> pulpit. I can't wait to get out of the pulpit. I don't like being a hypocrite, he mm -hmm. said, you know. Well, so wow. let's talk about this dilemma. And mm -hmm. it, when you interviewed people and, and the 30 in the book, they, they really are in a dilemma, aren't they? W yes. What did you learn? Well, we learned really all kinds of things. And one of the first things was that the people were so different from each other. I remember specifically when I interviewed uh, Adam Mann, uh, he wanted to know all about what I was studying. And he wanted to know all about the other clergy. He was one of the last of that group that I interviewed. And I said, you know, I really can't talk about that, but it, when, when I'm finished with my interview, maybe we can chat a little bit. And he asked me that, he said, what are they like? Are we all alike or are we all different? And I said, well, you're all different. And I said, that makes it interesting from a research point of view, but it also makes it harder to write about. Mm -hmm. uh, and what makes them different is their, everything about them, their early life, their early uh, religious experience, why they went uh, into the clergy, what kind of uh, denomination they went into, whether they were fundamentalists or were they, whether they went to seminary, what kind of family situation they had, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, their wives, and they were usually wives rather than husbands, were very um, religious themselves. And other times, um, they weren't, and they were more supportive. So, um, and the dilemmas are that they are not trained for something else, right? This is what they know. Uh, how do they support their families? Mm -hmm. Uh, how do they come out of the closet if that's what they're going to do? Are everyone, is everyone going to turn on them? That kind of thing? Yes, definitely. And um, some of them were like, they, they wanted to break out. They just wanted to get up there some Sunday morning and say, I don't believe any of this. But they knew they shouldn't do that, or they knew there could be, be repercussions if they did. Now, of these 900 people who are currently in the clergy project, mm -hmm. aren't the vast preponderance now out of the pulpit? Well, about a quarter of the group, roughly, it varies from mm -hmm. time to time, about a quarter are still in the pulpit. They're mm -hmm. still in the ministry. And these are all, they're not just church workers. These are ordained, professional, you know, wage-earning mm -hmm. clergy yes. who are, uh, this is their job. So about a quarter of them are still, and like Adam Mann, that's not his real name. Uh, no. You know, we learned his real name when he came out publicly at our convention there, where the same convention yeah, where you spoke. Mm -hmm. So while I have been freed from faith and belief in my mind, for several years now. For me, the celebration of true independence comes literally today. It comes right now. Now as I finally find the boldness to openly proclaim to the world that I'm no longer a member of the clergy or a person of faith, I live with reason as my guide, and I am an atheist. We learned there that his real name is Carter Warden, and he is, as you say, very talented and a very talented musician mm -hmm. as well. And how is he making it? He's doing well now. He's got a different job. He's finally out of the pulpit. He has an administrative job in a university, and he's doing quite well. He's, everybody loves him there from what I can tell. So that's a very good transition. Mm -hmm. So we have to take a break here, and after the break I want to talk a little bit about Jerry DeWitt. And then a little bit about this play that you're yes, working on as play. well. So um, we're talking with Linda Lascola, a researcher who co-wrote the book with Daniel Dennett, Caught in the Pulpit, about preachers who don't believe. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Ryan, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. Ever since I was young, I've always been taught to ask questions, ask why, and use the scientific method to see how things can be improved. I learned early on that this doesn't work at church, at least not for long. You'll see the hypocrisy and the inaccuracy of everything. I think that we should eliminate religion and treat each other with dignity and respect as people inherently do. Religion is divisive, and I think we can all be good people without the lure of eternal salvation or the threat of eternal punishment.
Before we get back to our interview, let's hear Linda Lascola describe the beginnings of the clergy project. We got a, a pastor called with a fake name, Adam Mann, and then agreed to have an initial anonymous phone conversation with me about participating in the study. He was so concerned about protecting his identity that he called me from a roadside phone, from a roadside phone booth when those things existed, to my fax line when those things existed, uh, because it uh, didn't have caller ID. After that phone call, he agreed to participate in the study, and he trusted me enough to give me his, will, his real name. The pilot study caused quite a stir, and soon Dan Dennett and I had lots of clergy contacting us directly to be in the next part of the study. This is when Dan Barker and Richard Dawkins saw an opportunity with these newly discovered atheist clergy to start a, the private online meeting place for apostate clergy that they had been thinking about since they first met in Iceland in the 2006 International Humanist and Ethical Union Convention. Soon, what came to be known as a clergy project was being planned. I was thrilled with the idea. Emails started flying between me and Dan Barker and Dan Dennett, Richard Dawkins, Todd Stiefel, and others in the secular movement. And then I wrote this next email to Adam. Adam, don't feel you need to spend a lot of time on this. My feeling is that you should be a recipient of this, serv of this service rather than focusing your energies on helping to plan it. And then I got an immediate response from Adam. No way I'm going to sit back on this one, he said. <laughs> this is an opportunity to use my talents and passions for a real good cause. Maybe I can be a recipient and a contributor at the same time. I'm just a pup, but you're in the big league now. You're in league with the big dogs now. Signed, Adam. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, and we are discussing the clergy project and research into ministers who have changed their beliefs and are caught in the pulpit. Yes with Linda mm -hmm. Lascola, and you're the co-author of a book called Caught in the Pulpit, and mm -hmm. it is quite a dilemma. We've been talking about some of the uh, former ministers that you have interviewed, Linda, who are part of the clergy project. And, uh, and one of those was uh, Jerry DeWitt. I think Jerry was one of the original 52, um, might have been. I think he came in after that, actually, because he called you, uh, as some of the others did. Yeah. And I think at that time, uh, the, the study was already in progress, the clergy project was already up, and he was, because I, I remember talking to him dur during the interviews, he was stunned and delighted that there already was a group of people like this already e in existence. Yeah, a brand new group, it uh -huh. had just come, well you can tell by looking at him that he's got these preacher skills, you know, mm -hmm. he and Carter Warden and, and many of the others. We spent a lifetime developing these personal preaching, pastoring skills, and what do you do? What do some of the former clergy do after they leave the ministry? Well, um, they do various things. Some of them, uh, they go back to school and, be, and get teacher skills. They become real estate agents. They um, uh, work in, in insurance. They, 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 there's a lot of things they can do. They have many skills in a parish or in a, uh, a, a church. Uh, and sometimes they don't realize how many skills they have. A lot of organizational uh, and administrative skills. Um, but it's difficult for them to get out because they're not only changing a job, they're changing a whole lifestyle. Uh, a whole, uh, they have a whole different uh, uh, relationship with their family and with their friends. And so it's, it's not as easy. I know it was easier for you, Dan, because I think it was easier for you because you came out many years ago at a time when computers were just being invented, as it were. And so you could we get had electricity it. back then. Yeah. <laughs> really, it yeah. wasn't really easy at all. Huh. You went through all of the same trials and tribulations. Well, for, for me, in the in the mid '80s, I had to buy books and go to the library. It wasn't mm -hmm. to look stuff up, right? And, and by the way, one of the books I bought was a book she read that she oh. wrote that I read that was influential too. Mm -hmm. And I should say that a lot of them decide to stay in the clergy, and a lot of them are not that. Um, upset about that prospect. If you're uh, an Episcopalian, for instance, you can pretty much be an agnostic. Uh, or United Church of Christ. Or United Church of Christ. Uh -huh. one or of Greta Vosper up in Canada. Yes, that's the uh, Canadian United version Canada. of the United Church her of Christ. Her church decided to keep her on after mm -hmm. they learned she was an atheist. Yes. Uh, so, and we had a, also a um, a rabbi, a, a conservative, not a conservative <laughs> rabbi, 
an Orthodox rabbi in the study hmm. who uh, is, is, has every intention of staying on. Wow. And he feels he's able to do it, and he wants to do it. His whole family is Orthodox. His wife is Orthodox. He's raising his children as Orthodox Jews. But that wouldn't work for me, no. For, mo for much, most of us, it right. wouldn't work. It's very much a personality thing. No, um, in your study, mm -hmm. uh, why did they lose their faith, or why did they change their minds about religion? It's, it's quite a radical thing to do. You're an ordained pastor, or priest, mm -hmm. or nun, or rabbi, and you stop believing. Well, you don't just stop. It happens slowly. And sometimes I think, after having listened to many of their stories, that uh, it would be a miracle if everyone's, every pastor's beliefs didn't change. Because they spent so much time not uh, just knowing the, the facts of uh, the Bible, but also dealing with people uh, in their ministry. Um, that, uh, that mean, at some point, they know that prayer doesn't really work very well. At least prayer doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It might make you feel better and feel calmer, but it doesn't cure your illnesses. At some point, they know after they've um, preached on a Bible story uh, 10 or 15 times that, you know, this story doesn't make very much sense. Uh, <laughs> hmm. So uh, I really think it's, it's, the question is why don't more of them leave rather than, um, and at least in my mind, but then I've never been clergy. You mentioned earlier um, how these clergy differ from each other, mm -hmm. but uh, I noticed, and I think you probably noticed as well, one thing that I think all of them have in common was reading. Mm -hmm. They read. In fact, Carter Warden at our, at our convention, yeah. he gave a list of the 60 books that he read because he wanted to validate. He, didn't, mm -hmm. he wanted to be sure. And reading the books and the authors and the history and the philosophy, I think that's one thing that we all find in common. Well, that was your story. Yeah. You were a believer, but you started to think, I need to be able to debate things like evolution mm -hmm. you, as a creationist, yeah. and so on. And then you, as you said, you, you, you really migrated mm -hmm. out of fundamentalism into more liberal, and then you examined the bathwater, and there was no baby there. Well, one of the fun things about being in the clergy project, and I get to be in it as a former, and you don't, sorry. I don't. I'm not well, in it. That's, it was one of, one of the rules that, that I made, actually, that I couldn't be part of it yeah. because I'm not clergy. Well, you were originally a, an administrator, but then you mm -hmm. had to back out. I, but, I, I backed off. But one of the fun things that we've all discovered in the clergy project is what did you read? What did you read? Comparing mm -hmm. notes. So what book can you recommend? And there's a lot of this going on about because we're thirsty for this knowledge. Mm -hmm. And didn't a lot of you actually sit down and read the Bible, too? Oh, well, yeah. The <laughs> One of the people, uh, the original people in the study, he didn't do any other reading except for the Bible. And he read it very slowly uh, over a period of a couple of years. And uh, that's what convinced him to be, that's how he became an atheist. Yeah, a certain number of members of the Freedom From Religion Foundation mm -hmm. will put that down as the reason for their loss of faith, that they actually started reading the Bible, not just the more palatable mm -hmm. passages. So and we have about four minutes, and yes. um, you want to get to your play. You, you told oh. us that you're working, or some, something yes. about a play about There's your work. There's a play in development right now, and the play is another thing that I never expected to happen, just like the clergy project. And that is when Dan Dennett was reading the transcripts of the interviews that I did, he looked at it and he said, this is drama. Hmm. To hear uh, how they reacted, the questions I asked, the, the way they answered them, he thought this would make a great play. And uh, he, I didn't really know much about uh, plays myself, and I sort of laughed it off. But he was serious, and as time went on, he was approaching people about it. And we found a wonderful playwright. Her name is Marion Gazaniga. Hmm. And we got permission from, I think, 17 people in the study for her to be able to read their transcripts and make a play out of it. And there have been several readings now in New York City. We have a wonderful executive producer named Megan Kingery. We are in uh, partnership with a uh, theater company in New York and are hoping for a production uh, in the 1920 season or really? perhaps after that, yes. Now, will this be off-Broadway? It'll be off-Broadway, and then our hope is that it will go to universities and, uh, and in other places, other regional theaters. You mean wow. 2020, don't you? Did I say 1920? Well, well, that gives us <laughs> another excuse to go to New York City. Right. Wow, we'll, we'll look forward yes. to that. Does the play have a title? The play doesn't have a title yet. The working title is Caught in the Pulpit, but we're thinking, trying to think of something snappier than that. Yeah. So. Although I think that's a very good title. <laughs> what about music? Well, that's, uh, all these things are being looked into right yeah. now. Now, Linda, one thing we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. and we don't have too much time left, but what about the women? 
Do you have women in the study? Are there women in the clergy project? There are women in the study and in the clergy project, but there are many fewer women than men. I had a hard time finding women for the study. But that would be for an obvious reason, that women were really excluded from a lot yes. of the clergy until well, very recently. Yes, and women still should, are excluded. Yes. They should keep silent in the church, the Bible says. Yes, and I also think, I mean, most of the women in the clergy now are in the uh, more liberal religions, and those are the people who tend to be happiest. They don't really need to leave as much as the other because they can, they can fudge it more. Any nuns in this, any former nuns in the study? Uh, there are not. I didn't meet former nuns until the clergy project was formed. Now I know we, a lot of former nuns. We know some, nuns. but... <laughs> right. Well, there are nuns in the clergy project uh -huh. now with some who are gri out, gripping out of, stories. Out there of now. the nunneries, I, correct. I wish that I, we could have had more women and certainly Catholic nuns. It was hard to find Catholics as well. Now, what about uh, people, uh, Muslims, imams, or other... Uh, there are some in the clergy project, yeah. is that right? But we, we couldn't find, I mean, we couldn't find a lot of people for the clergy pro for the clergy study. It was very mm -hmm. difficult. You can't just go knock on the door of a <laughs> right. mosque and say, hey, do you believe? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but they, they come to us occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, any advice for somebody who might be caught in the pulpit who's listening right yes, now? Yes, I do. My advice is to read the Rational Doubt blog, which is on the Patheos platform. Mm -hmm. It's a blog that I edit, and most mm -hmm. of the posts are by members of the clergy project. And it's called Rational Doubt for a Reason. It's for people who are in that phase, that period, where they've got lots of reasons to doubt, but they don't quite know what to do about it. Rational Doubt. Yes. Well, On doubt is very rational. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, the clergy project is a very important part of um, supporting people who do doubt from the pulpit. So will there be another book, do you think? There's a lot of stories. That's a wonderful idea. Maybe yeah. we can find somebody to write it. After the play, <laughs> after the play is done, uh, another mm -hmm. book of stories. Well, thank you, Linda, Linda Lascola, for uh, all of your work as a researcher and as an author and a person who truly cares about people who are stuck in the pulpit. Mm. Uh, so get that book caught in the pulpit, and we are certainly going to look forward to this off-Broadway play about this dilemma of, of ministers and clergy. Or maybe on ministers. Broadway, who knows, it could be a big, a big hit. Well, and thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters.